Hey, hey homos, homos. Welcome, welcome back to our podcast. Wow, we did that in sync. We've, like, yeah, we're getting good at that. <laughs> um, welcome back to our podcast. I am Keegan. Yeah, and I'm Joel. We're boyfriends. We are, still to this day. <laughs> Over a year going strong, not the relationship, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We're in on two years, aren't we? I know, our anniversary is next week. Two years. It's this week. This week? Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, behind the scenes there. We do record <laughs> a week in advance. Oh. Um, yeah, this week is our two-year anniversary. Yeah? Oh God, that's gone very slowly. Two years being in a relationship with me. How do you feel? I feel... Honoured and blessed. Honoured and blessed, correct <laughs> answer. Um, I actually think it's flown by. It has I, gone really fast. At the same time, it feels like we've been together forever. I feel like we're two old men together. Oh, just don't lump me in as an old man. <laughs> when we're sat on the sofa drinking chamomile tea, reading books. Yeah, that's just rest and recuperation. <laughs> well, anyway, that's all our parish notices here at Happy Healthy Homo HQ in terms of What's going on with us? Well, yeah, there's there's nothing exciting to uh, inform you of. No. Um, next week, well, you won't, you probably won't see, but I'm having an operation on my nose. Getting a nose job, guys. I'm not getting a nose job. I'm having a septoplasty. But which is what all the celebs say when they get a nose job. They say, oh, it wasn't a nose job. It was a deviated septum. And it's like, but your nose shape has changed. But as you can probably tell from watching the podcast, if you're watching this on YouTube, Keegan has, I think, the perfect nose. It's like super straight it's not too big not too small joel, it like fits his face so well joel wood nose fetish um <laughs> uh, my nose is the only straight thing about me a bit too hard at that <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not <laughs> um yeah it's the only straight thing about me is my nose so i don't yeah. want them to change anything no but i would like internal. to be able to breathe through it that would be ideal it would help certainly. we think it's due to rugby getting smashed in the face yeah I think they said it's from breaks and stuff so um yeah so I'll, I'll, I'm lying in. Uh, uh. Yeah, so as you're listening to this podcast, he'll be in full recovery mode. I'll be in nurse mode. I've cancelled a work event. I was supposed to go on the set of Emmerdale ITV and I've had to pull out because I need to be nurse for He's Keegan. also bought a nurse uniform <laughs> yeah. and a pinny. That's for later. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to being a little nurse for a week or two. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... I don't really know. That's kind of no, it, isn't it. That's kind of it. In terms of your parish notices, guys, if you wouldn't mind rating, reviewing the podcast, follow us on audio platforms, follow us on YouTube, just all the things. You know, we bang on about it every week, so you know what to do. But just a reminder in case yeah. you haven't. Yeah, we do. We're doing things a little bit. We're doing things a little bit differently this week because of the subject topic. We've yeah. we've changed like the order of things. Um, so trigger warning. Oh, can we do a noise? <laughs> is that, a... that is not a trick. We need a special trigger warning one. Sure well, it's a heavy topic. So, um, also, yeah. I would just like to apologize before we get into it because last week I said people were moaning about the sound, and I said, and I was, uh, it was very much egg on my face moment because last week I didn't press record on the microphones. You so, can imagine that what the feelings were when we just wrapped on a 50 minute episode and Keegan went, We didn't press record. I didn't press record. He then looked at me as if it was my fault. And I went, you were the one playing with the levels. And luckily he was just like, oh yeah, I'm yeah, so sorry. It was me. It was all me. Um, it's okay. They can still hear us. And that's the main thing. Yeah. But hope the sound will be a lot better today because the microphones yeah. are actually turned on. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you want to get in touch with us, you'll see the importance of sending your voice notes and videos into us in this episode. So if you would like to do that, you can do it on Instagram. It's probably mm -hmm. the easiest way to send your voice notes and videos. Or you can email us, hello at happyhealthyhomo.com. If you want to check out our website, happyhealthyhomo.com, you can subscribe to our newsletter, you can see what's going on, and you can get involved. And if you want to check out our Patreon as well, patreon.com forward slash happyhealthyhomo. Yeah. Well, you can get yourself an exclusive Happy Healthy Homo mug. Yeah, if you join our, our, our very important homo tier. But there's loads of tiers, so check yourself, check us out, and check everything. <laughs> check everything, guys. Check your balls as well if you're a man. If you're a woman, check your boobs. Just, just a tangent, but we should all be checking our bodies. Okay. Since we're talking about checking out. Check in. Okay. There, <laughs> anyway. we, there we go. Um, how do we segue from... So this is a very big sidestep into today's topic. Yeah. We're talking about abusive relationships. Mm -hmm. 
So it's it's heavy. So we wanted to give it the the gravitas that it deserves. But the the aim of this episode is to a raise awareness. And B, to also try to help shift some of the stigma. I think especially there's lots of information about there, about there. There's lots of information out there about uh, heterosexual women in abusive relationships, which mm-hmm. is obviously the vast majority, but not all. There's heterosexual men in abusive relationships and there's also LGBT people in abusive yeah. relationships as well. And so we wanted to mm-hmm. we wanted to touch on all types of abusive relationships. So we want to raise some awareness about it. We want to share some experiences of some of you guys, um, have a little touch on on ours. And then we also want to help you, if you're in an abusive relationship, what you can do to get out of it, who you can contact, who you can help. Or if you suspect your friend of being in an abusive relationship, we're going to cover how to to spot that and how to help them as well. So hopefully give it a full 360 definitely but please don't take this episode as like we're the experts on this and we're Mm. you like go do some research as keegan said we'll put some resources in the description of this youtube video or in the show notes if you're listening to this on an audio platform to direct you to the correct places a if you you're going through something like in an abusive relationship or a friend is or if you just want to learn more about it we are not the most wise people like that know everything about a subject. We are just, again, like the whole podcast, two regular guys in a relationship that are chatting about things which we think can relate to the gay community. Yeah, which are important. And we have both experienced abusive relationships in the past, so we will touch on our own experiences. But yeah, please don't just take everything we say as read. We're not, you know, psychotherapists. We're not... um, Counselors or or anything like that. But we're... Doing our best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the nice first point to touch on is what you've touched on about... Because when I went through an abusive relationship, it was... There's a book that I'll recommend at the end of this episode. But again, it was all from a woman's perspective being in an abusive relationship with a man. And like you saying, the majority of people in an abusive relationship are women in a straight relationship. But that's only people who've declared it. Mm. And I think there are so many men out there, not just in gay relationships, but straight men who are abused by their girlfriend or wife who are so ashamed and so embarrassed that when they've done surveys like that, of course they're not going to say, like, I'm being abused by my girlfriend because there's so much shame attached to it. So I wonder, actually, whether it is a 50-50 equal playing field with abusive relationships. It's just women are more likely to admit to it I don't know what the psychology behind that is, but I feel like women are more, they're they're less ashamed of something like that than men are. Well, I think that's the societal setup of the the patriarchy and all that kind of stuff where, you know, men are seen as dominant breadwinners, da-da-da-da-da, so ergo, if they were Mm. to be being abused by what has historically women have been set up as like the lesser sex, which obviously isn't true. Mm. Um, so for someone to be abused or just for men in general to be abused, there's a lot of shame in, you know, even in being in gay, being gay to then be in a gay relationship and have come out and have done all that. And mm. then to say, well, I've actually, I'm, I'm, I'm out and I'm in an abusive relationship. Yeah. It's like, it kind of feeds into all the negative things that we're told about being gay. So it's just, it's obviously, it's incredibly difficult whether you're a man or a woman. There's lots of layers of shame. Yeah. Um, I I'm not saying anybody has it worse or better than no. anybody else, but the, you know, there, there, there are, there are different dynamics yeah. depending on your sex, depending on yeah. your sexuality. But when the all the advice out there is usually tailored to women in straight relationships, I know from me when I read this book that was brilliant and I got over myself and I was like, when they're talking about she and her and da da da, da it still applies it's to all me. Relevant, but yeah. I felt that shame as well, where I was like, is this something that's just supposed to happen to women? Which of course is ridiculous. No, it shouldn't happen to anyone. But the fact that it's tailored more towards women, I suppose it's similar to like eating disorders and things. It's like, it's usually tailored to women. But I I hate that, that the advice out there is mainly tailored to women when it can happen to men as well. Well, hopefully, you know, people talking about things more, you know, you just look at the change in mental health, Mm. um, you know, men talking about the mental health and and charities and, Mm. you know, Andy's Man Club and other things like that that are out there. Hopefully us having this conversation and and other people doing it and people talking about things on social media Mm. and even um you know shows 
that are on TV. Just yeah. just little things like that just nudges things in, yeah. in the right direction. Well, talking about we've been watching Baby Reindeer on Netflix, and that is a man who is being abused by a woman. So yeah, and he's also abused by a man as well. In yeah. his there's, yeah. there's there's loads of different stuff going on Definitely. in there, and, and in like the researching this for, for for the podcast i wasn't aware of how many different types mm. of abuse there are there are the ones that you would you know automatically go to physical emotional um psychological which are probably very as they're similar but slightly different financial sexual mm -hmm. But then there was things like stalking, there was things like threatening... Technological. Technological cyberbullying and things yeah. like that. Um, yeah. There was also threatening people's like families, children, mm -hmm. things like that as well. Yeah. Yeah, so there's lots of different types that that was even news to us, but we're going to break some of them down to run through with you guys. Yeah, um, yeah, we figured we'd run through like the the ones that people are more likely to experience in a relationship because obviously like stalking, cyberbullying... Mm -hmm is obviously abuse and i'm not it probably does happen in relationships but maybe it's we, we just we, we're painting with broad strokes here yeah. so bear with us so I, I, and something that i think is important to mention about abuse is that it's a pattern of behavior because people will often say like mm -hmm. is is one thing like people make mistakes right yeah um so, so yeah. i think it's important to note that abuse is a pattern of behavior but also like one time is probably too much yeah. yeah you know and and it depends where you are and what's going on and things but mm. um it would be a big red flag if there was one incident yeah um well it's just in the same way that when people talk about toxic relationships there's difference between a toxic person or a toxic relationship and toxic behavior mm. we have all displayed toxic behavior in isolated events yeah. in our relationships but that doesn't mean it's a repeated pattern which would make it a toxic person or a toxic relationship. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously the first type of abuse, physical abuse, mm. probably the one that springs to people's mind the most, yeah. is which which is not necessarily to do with actually hitting the person all mm -hmm. the time. Obviously hitting someone, slapping someone, choking someone, mm -hmm. that is all a, a physical abuse. But it's also like breaking things, yeah. breaking um, like the victim's possessions smashing things around them the throwing, threat of violence the threat of violence to to them mm -hmm. or to loved ones family members things like that yeah. um which i'd not really thought of to be honest i thought you yeah. know someone punching someone is physical abuse but yeah absolutely if someone's like launching plates around or you feel you feel the threat of violence well yeah because you've got to understand how that feels i know of someone where their partner had angry with the person punched a hole through their wall in their flat um and that think how terrifying that must be mm. for that person that is physical abuse even though they weren't harmed in it i mean their flat was harmed and they were really scared yeah there's nothing worse than being around a person especially someone you're in a relationship with or a friend or a family member where the th the you feel like you're walking on eggshells and mm -hmm. you don't know how they're going to react yeah. to something. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a, a horrible feeling that like that sense yeah. of dread and anxiety. Mm. So the next one is emotional abuse, which some people, like you said, their, their go to thought when they think about abusive relationships is physical abuse, but emotional abuse can be just as harmful. Mm, um, it's uh, like we said, there is something called psychological abuse. I actually don't know the difference to that. Um, but I would lump them as being very similar in the same. That could be something as over as like your partner calling you mean and hurtful names and like hurting your feelings. It could be things like gaslighting. So I know I've experienced that where someone might um, make things, uh, someone might sort of trick you into thinking that you're not remembering things correctly, mm. that your memory is not right. Um, uh, another one is like withholding love and support. So again, I've experienced someone that, ignores and shuts down completely if they're pissed off at you um oh, yeah, and true. that is psychologically damaging like if mm. your partner refuses to talk to you not even just a I, let's just not talk for a bit but actively will not look at you talk to you that is emotionally abusive yeah emotional abuse is essentially making another person feel unloved afraid mm -hmm. or inadequate yeah in some way there's also something that is unique to gay people in that it's 
I mean, you could obviously you can do this in any relationship, weaponizing somebody's fears. Yeah. But the threat of outing someone yeah um is kind of emo is emotional abuse mm -hmm. um threatening to tell family friends people that yeah. the work and things like that which i mean being outed or the threat of being outed is yeah a horrendous feeling and it's something yeah. that is only unique to us as as lgbt people yeah well i suppose yeah emotional abuse is anything that makes you as a person as a human being feel worried fearful or in danger, like um, emotionally as well as physically, they can be tied into it. Because, for example, yeah. the fear of like coming out could be linked to, well, my family are not supportive of that, and what would they do yeah. physically to me if yeah, you've got yeah, yeah. someone from a very religious or cultural yeah. background? Yeah, 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 different yeah, cultural absolutely. Background. And then there's obviously sexual abuse, which is like it, it could be coercion, it could be weaponizing someone's sexuality, um, and it can be you know anything from like the obvious stuff of you know, rape, non-consexual sex to things like revenge porn, mm -hmm. taking photos, you know, or um, even like being aggressive during se non-consensual sex, non-consensual sexual acts. That's a mm -hmm. mouthful. Um, where it's, you know, you might be having sex with someone and then they start being physically abusive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people might like a bit of rough, but then there's, too much and just mm -hmm. carrying on and not listening to someone that is sexual abuse which people might not think yeah. of they might just think oh that's how that person is but that is yeah like, what? no means no right also being in a relationship doesn't mean that you can't be sexually abused by your partner which i was something that only in the last few years that i've been aware of because i was like well if you're in a relationship like there's no sexual abuse because you're in a relationship together, but that is completely wrong. Yeah, absolutely. There absolutely is sexual abuse and um, sexual assault in relationships. Well, they 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 brought into law, didn't they? I can't remember. It wasn't it wasn't that long ago, really, that um, a man can rape his wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that that's not an old law? No, at all. Yeah. I would say I I, I, I won't, I won't want to hazard a guess, but maybe nineties. 80s 90s like it's not fairly recent yeah yeah no that's again it serves into feeds into this ideology that someone in a relationship with someone else be, like becomes property yeah. or that they have ownership over them which mm. is a horrendous thing to yeah. to talk about for, for someone as, as a human being mm. yeah so then we've got psychological abuse, which, mm. as Joe has mentioned, is similar to emotional abuse. So it's, the difference is that. Emotional abuse is making someone feel bad. Mm -hmm. Psychological abuse is disrupting their thinking. Okay. Um, so gaslighting, like yeah, I said, yeah, I exactly. that so, is trying to trick you into thinking that yeah. you are mentally unstable. Yeah, altering somebody's yeah. sense of reality. You didn't say that. You didn't do that. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I think like which is you, you can see the how they would be lumped in together. Mm. Um, but, you know, like trying to convince someone that their concerns are due to their own misconceptions and yeah. their own, you know, you, you shouldn't be worried about me wanting to do X, Y, and Z. I mm. th something that is prevalent, I think, in the gay community with this, which is psychological abuse, mm. is when people have, people in relationships have grinder. Yeah. And, then the, and then someone will say something to them about it and they'll say what's wrong with you i'm i'm not doing anything i'm just on there to, to, make, friends. to make friends no what? one is on grinder to make friends or find a new housemate i've had it before i feel dumb admitting it but i've had my partner on grinder set and then say i was using it to find a flatmate you know i'm looking for a flat and i was like yeah and he was like and i want my flatmates to be gay and i was like oh yeah oh i'm i'm really sorry in hindsight and he was cheating on me so i was right like how dumb am i but that would be psychological abuse, making turning it around onto me, making me feel as if I'm the crazy one. Yes. When actually I'm not. Well, yeah, insisting that the victim is like, mm -hmm. is wrong or is the abuser. Yeah. You know, I think that's something that happens. No, you did this to me mm -hmm. and I'm just reacting. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Um, or even... Or even like denying that the abuse ever occurred. I didn't yeah. do that. What yeah. are you talking about? That that didn't happen. Mm. Um, deny, deny, deny. Yeah, uh, it, it's really like it's really, really harmful, and you can see why things like that are so damaging to people, mm. um, and why that then inhibits people's ability to trust in other relationships. Yeah. And I think 
certainly psychological abuse is so prevalent. I'm not so prevalent because I don't want I don't want some right wing dickhead to take you know take this out of context and say see all the gays are in abusive relationships but i think that something is pre- more prevalent in gay relationships than it is in heterosexual relationships is there's shame attached mm. and there's a difference between like a lot of us come to terms with our sexuality through sex like we go yeah. all right uh, yeah I, I i fancy men mm-hmm. but then to we're con- constantly told that loving a man is a terrible thing. That's that's the bad thing. Like, go do a bit of bumming, but actually having a, a happy, you know, mm. relationship, whatever that looks like, <clears throat> that's where a lot of people, they kind of come to, semi come to terms with their sexuality, but there's still shame attached to the relationship side of it. Yeah. And I think that's why th- that kind of psychological abuse is, is more, more pre- i'm saying it's more prevalent that the the amount of people that speak about it who've been in gay relationships where that's happened compared yeah. to well also there's not really been any role models of healthy gay relationships i certainly can't point to any growing up not growing up. not growing up nowadays there are mm. um and but yeah growing up is like well how are gay men supposed to nurture a healthy loving relationship with a partner if you haven't really got anything to point towards now you could argue well do they need to be gay you could see a straight relationship yeah absolutely but there is something about representation and going oh this could be me if you've never been able to point to a gay relationship that is happy and healthy then you could be forgiven for thinking that that's not possible. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and especially when you're told that constantly growing yeah. up, you'll be sad, you'll be lonely. Yeah. You'll be depressed. Men are terrible. Yeah. Especially you get that, like, uh, yeah. and I understand where women are coming from or where people are coming from when they say that. Yeah. But obviously that's, it's those sweeping statements are, yeah. they sit in our subconscious then and yeah. there's an element of, you know, I'm going to get hurt. Yeah. Um, and also I think as we come to terms with our sexuality and we, you know, I think back to earlier relationships that I've been in, I like, I, I was an, a bit of an arsehole, mm. like, probably a lot of an arsehole. <laughs> um, I, but it wasn't that I was an arsehole like as a, as a person, like, I, well, I'd like to think I'm not, but I've certainly evolved and developed and come to terms with lots of things. And, you know, I can mm. see why I acted in certain ways. And obviously lots of therapy has helped with that. And I think people have to, well, maybe not everybody does, but I certainly had to go through a, that period mm. to evolve and adjust into the version of me that I am today where I actually like myself and I'm, I'm yeah. you know, happy in a relationship and I know what I'm about. And I think a lot of people yeah. struggle to go through that. Well, I think that's really nice because that shows actually you do have to work at, not not being an arsehole but you have to work on yourself no one because i think someone could look at someone that they would aspire to be like and go well it's all right for them because they're naturally kind they're naturally not anxious they're naturally you know healthy or they're naturally this Mm. whereas actually no everyone everyone i know who i aspire to be like has done work on themselves whether it's through therapy whether it's they're constantly looking at self-improvement and self-help books or whatever it is yeah. like i they've done work they haven't just been born into so actually i think that's a nice thing for you to admit is like the the key in you are now is not just i am just who i am i was born yeah. like healthy no I, it's yeah. you've done work on yourself yeah I did, yeah i didn't didn't like who i was yeah. that's why i started doing stuff i was mm. very angry and, and stuff when i was when I was younger and when I was coming out and Mm. coming to terms with it. And the last one that we are going to touch on today is financial abuse, which is anything that is in control of your finances. So it might be hard to relate this exactly to a relationship, but for example, if your partner was forcing you to work for free on their business. Or make make them give over their money. Their control of finances. If you've got a joint bank account, you decide to move in with each other, you've got a joint bank account, but then one partner controls that and the other one, Maybe they give you an allowance or they refuse to let you see what's in the bank. Yeah. That's financial abuse. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's, you don't like, especially again, it feeds into these old tropes where, you know, men would control the money and yeah. women would be given like housekeeping. I remember my grandma was given like housekeeping money <laughs> and, and I'm sure she was content with it at the time. Well, obviously she was, but yeah. like, 
no, that's not cool. Well, I know from my female friends, there is actually a, a thing about that of like empowering women with finances because there are so many cases of men dying, leaving their wives on their own. The wives have no idea what money they've got, where their finances are, the passwords to the accounts, or they don't know how to manage the finances because they came from that background. Mm. It's usually the older generations where women, women had nothing to do with money. Yeah. So my friends are my age and it's all about empowering women and they're enrolled on courses or trying to educate themselves with money. Yeah. So it is a thing for, for women as yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. So look after your own finances. Yeah. It's your money. You've earned it. You've earned it normally we like break the show up but i think we, we're just gonna we're just gonna roll through and we want to share some voice notes some videos that people have been brave enough to to send in mm -hmm. sharing their experiences and i think this is why this is why we wanted to do this so mm -hmm. didn't we because we wanted to get other people's voices other people's faces on you know rather than just sitting with one person and, and talking to them as a yeah. guest or you know it's it's being able to get different people's experiences yeah. so yeah this, this is this is amazing so yeah thank and you also just want to say we did have someone submit something and then revoke it and say actually i really i shouldn't have set, like sent this and took it back which i think is absolutely fine obviously we're not going to play it but it just shows that the people that have sent things in have been really brave mm. in sharing their experiences because it is often met with shame that you've let yourself get into yeah. an abusive relationship. So I just want to, again, yeah, give kudos to these people that have sent in videos and voice notes just to say, thank you for doing that. We know that this is scary. Mm. And um, yeah, we really appreciate that you've done that. Yeah. Well, let's listen to Robert's voice note. I am a six foot four, pretty well built guy. And I was in a relationship about 10 years ago with a younger guy who was significantly smaller than me. Um, he, unbeknownst to me, was on quite severe antidepressants and was taking steroids. His mood swings or schizophrenic tendencies really were really extreme. And he nearly killed me on three separate occasions. Love bombing and then just really, really abusive, physically abusive um, relationship. It was scary. Yeah, my friends just laughed at me because of our different build sizes. Um, and nobody really took me seriously. I felt quite alone in the situation. It was very difficult to extract myself from it. There's a whole... I could I could talk to you about this for ages. There was, there was a lot that was going on in the back not a lot going on a lot of experiences that happened um that very few people know about because i just couldn't talk about it because nobody took it seriously um and I, it was very difficult to extract myself from the relationship because i'm very empathetic i wanted to help and support him more than my own concern for my own welfare which was really alarming after the event mm. yeah i mean yeah thank you robert for sending that in i think like as someone who's six foot four themselves i i was in a, a quite a short relationship with someone who attacked me a couple of times mm. um and i completely empathize like there's an element of shame as a bigger human being mm. and it feels like you are punished because you don't want to respond with violence yeah like i know in my situation, I could have cracked him. Yeah. But it's just not in my net. I, I wouldn't no. want to do that, especially to someone who, you know, you care about. And, and like Robert says, you want to yeah. help them. Yeah. Um, so it feeds into, there's the shame of being a man. There's the shame of mm. being a certain size, uh, yeah. you know, and, and the fact that you, you tell people and then they don't support you yeah. is, it, I completely understand why I would feel alone. I was yeah. very lucky that I, when I told my friends that, they did spot me and mm. i had to stop them going and uh setting about yeah. <laughs> setting about him um safe to say that relationship didn't last very long but again mm. it's very you can't read the label when you're in the bottle right no. and it's it, it, you know robert alluded to it then when you're out of the relationship yeah and you can see look back and you you go oh my god i can't believe yeah that i hung around 
but when you're in the thick of it it mm. feels all consuming and and that you're trapped yeah. in it and because it's re i think it's really easy for people to just go why didn't you just leave i know and that's the horrible part that people do say that and as an empathetic person like robert said and same with me same with you and someone who wants to believe the best in people and i know from my background growing up in a church background where kind of the vibe is to put other people first mm. and to always think of other people. I know when I've experienced an abusive relationship where, again, it was paired like with Robert said, with love bombing. So really something bad happens, a real like bit of abuse basically. And then the apologies that I'm so sorry, the love bombing, the buying flowers, the going, the self-deprecating going, it's because I'm so messed up. It's because I'm on antidepressants. It's because my, my parents weren't there for me when I was a kid. It's because of this. I know for me, it made me feel sorry for that person and go, okay, I forgive you. Like, as long as we're going to work on it and mm. like, I will help you to be better. And like, like it was, and now out of that, I've spoken to my parents about it and my parents were like, that was the worst thing that church has like taught all of us. And they disagree with it is yeah. of course you shouldn't put someone else before you. That's not, we, you should always put yourself first yeah, your and look after your yourself needs. first. Yeah. But as you, you, and this is slight tangent, but as you saw going to a Christian wedding where someone was spouting that same thing still, yeah. put the other person first and it's had a really damaging effect. And I probably wouldn't have stuck around in that relationship had I not been brought up with the view of look after other people, put other people first. Mm. So Robert, you mustn't, I know you probably don't feel this anymore, but you mustn't take on board this experience and go, oh, this is my responsibility. And like, how on earth could I have put up with yeah. that? Like we all stay for various reasons and it's very easy, like King said, with hindsight, step out of that and go, yeah. why did I stay? But well, in the moment the, it feels very real. It's never ever the person who's being abused fault. No. <laughs> it's never ever that. I no. think it's really important to remember. Mm. So the next voice note we have is from Jordan. So let's have a listen. Oh. Hi there. I'm replying to your request about domestic violence experiences and I'd like to share my story. I was raised very conservative Christian in the American South. My homosexuality was suppressed for 30 years. During my adult life, I was in a, a heterosexual marriage for seven years. My now ex-wife was a no-nonsense, my way or the highway kind of gal, and I allowed her to run my life because I was already used to compromising myself. Near the end of our relationship, I started to have my awakening. I came out to her and spilled my heart out letting her know I was having strange feelings towards men and that I thought I might be gay. That's when her mentality in our marriage changed. She strongly encouraged me to attend Christian counseling and began to isolate me from friends and family, making sure she, that she was involved in any free time I had. Who I was, though, was screaming to come out. After two years of struggling with myself, I flat out came out to her and expressed that we may need to evaluate our relationship in future. She told me I wasn't gay and that she would expose me if I left her. I stayed two more years. During those years, she became verbally, emotionally, physically abusive and would gaslight me with every disagreement. After seven years, I finally left and I'm now engaged to the man of my dreams I'm still healing from my scars, but at least I'm free. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, what a happy ending to a story, but those years must have been hell. I, I think the, the something that I, I mean, I find really interesting as someone who was in a heterosexual marriage as well, is the things that you, the kind of dumbing down of yourself and the things that you kind of say yes to or okay to because there's an element of, shame guilt or whatever mm. is going on and so it, mm. and then when you start to challenge that um i mean like, a, a, every type of abuse that we've mentioned in this podcast well like you uh, said the fear of being outed yeah um that's a perfect example of that and that that might not just happen in a straight relationship yeah. but in a gay relationship if you're not out and the other person is but that's that's awful like think of the yeah. fear that you live with every day thinking that if you step out of line in inverted commas, that your partner would go and out you to your friends and family. Yeah, and I d again, just to reiterate, I do think it's so important to get these, your guys' voice notes in and videos mm -hmm. in because as, in, as horrible as that is to hear, there's a happy ending at the, at the end of it. Yeah. Like there's a way through it. And I think that's, that's important to talk about as well. Yeah. Um, so our video that we've got now is 
from Brad, which firstly, Brad, thank you for sending in a video. It's nice to yeah. uh, put a face to a voice. Yeah. And um, to everyone listening to this, this is a bit of a longer one. It's about five minutes long, but um, I think it's a really important story to share. Yeah, so. and it's articulated very well. Yep. So My name is Brad Garrison. My pronouns are he, him. I am a registered psychotherapist and Canadian certified counselor in Ontario, Canada. I'm an individual relationship and sex therapist, and I work pretty extensively with members of 2S LGBTQ plus communities. For maybe six, seven years, something like that, I was a group therapist and case coordinator for a court mandated group therapy program for gay, bi, queer, and trans guys in Toronto, Ontario, who were charged with or associated with, involved with in some way, domestic violence offenses. And so I'm so glad that you are talking about this issue. Thank you so much. It's a really important issue that I think isn't discussed enough, certainly not in, in our communities. Domestic violence in our communities is in some ways really similar to domestic violence that occurs in cisgender heterosexual relationships. You know, for example, we know based on research that the rates of domestic violence in queer contexts are at least the same as they are in heterosexual cisgender relationships. And we've also got a lot of research that says that domestic violence might actually be a little more common in certain kinds of relationship configurations or in certain communities in our, in our spaces. So it's something that's really essential, actually, that we talk about. Because there are also some key ways that domestic violence looks really different in 2S LGBTQ plus communities. You know, for example, there are really particular forms of abuse that can take place in, in our context, in our communities. So for example, like identity related abuses are, are much more common. So think about, you know, that partner threatening to out you in your workplace or, you know, abuses related to HIV status and access to medications and, and those kinds of things. There are also particular points of stigma and shame that can show up and get in the way. You know, we sometimes view domestic violence as being like a, a cisgender heterosexual women's issue. And so people both inside and outside of our communities can often really struggle to identify or recognize domestic violence as being a queer issue. And then of course, there are just the challenges associated with help seeking and safety and, and access. So where do 2S LGBTQ plus folks go when they are concerned or experiencing something like domestic violence? Are there laws and organizations in their community that are supportive and informed, both about the complexities and nuances of gay communities and queer communities and, and our lives and our relationships, but also that are knowledgeable and, and aware of domestic violence in those contexts. We can also sort of think about police and, and the legalities, like how will police respond? What are the laws in our communities? So in Ontario, Canada, for example, uh, when police become involved in a domestic violence situation, they are, generally speaking, required to press charges. It's not in the relationship's hands. The police do that. And that comes from a specific situation that happened several years ago, or quite a few years ago now, I suppose, involving a cisgender heterosexual relationship where the woman was receiving quite significant abuse from her male partner. Police became involved. The woman, fearing that police involvement would not help, would actually make things worse and perhaps escalate the violence, declined to press charges. So police left and she was actually killed by that partner not too long afterwards. And so now police have to lay charges. But when police show up, they, like most individuals, rely on scripts, societal scripts and, and discursive understandings of what domestic violence is, what it looks like, how it shows up. And so in most cases, when police show up in a cisgender heterosexual context, they're gonna arrest the male partner. And they're gonna charge him or sort of focus on him. What do they do when they show up and it's two men? What do they do when it is two men who are involved in an altercation at the bathhouse? What do they do when it is three women, two cis women and, and one trans woman? What do they do when it is a male partner and a non-binary partner? What do they do when it is a polyamorous throuple playing with a fourth for the evening and domestic violence occurred? It, it gets complex pretty quickly and the scripts that police and society generally relies on fall apart pretty quickly in our, in our context and in these communities. So there's really significant education and advocacy and just work to be done to make this actually safe and supportive for everybody. And the very last thing that I will say in my really long story, I'm so sorry it's taken so long, this is something I could talk about for hours, is just that help seeking tends to look really differently in our communities because of a lot of this stuff. 
So please reach out, please speak with somebody. If you or somebody you know is experiencing domestic violence in 2SLGBTQ plus communities, start with what you know and where you feel safe. That might be your sexual health clinic, that might be a friend, that might be a local nonprofit, that might be your gay man's knitting circle. You know, wherever you feel safe and in community is your place to start. I should also mention that with the increasing availability of online psychotherapy, help might be available even if it's not in your local community. I work at an online psychotherapy practice, Healing Path Therapy, and I quite regularly receive communication and requests for support from 2SLGBTQ plus community members across the province of Ontario, not just in my local region, but across the province and even across the country. Um, and so have a look, there is help and there is support available. It can be challenging to find, no question. And so I say sort of start with where you feel safe so that you're not dealing with this alone because you, you don't have to. Again, thanks so much for talking about this. Take good care, everybody. Be well. Well, that's great to hear from an actual expert and yeah. a professional who works in, in the this field. Arena. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that's a nice thing for us to sort of, as we're sort of circling back and landing this podcast is how to reach out or what are the steps to take if you are someone going through this. And as Brad pointed out, I think starting with a community or who, whoever you feel most comfortable with I think is really great because my first gut instinct would be like, go to a registered charity, go to the police, go to whatever. But it's really nice that, that nice advice that if you're too scared to do that, just reaching out to someone or someone you feel safe with, whether it's a therapist, your friends, is a really good start to make. Yeah, and obviously, like it's important to remember the signs. If if you are in an abusive relationship, it's important to not blame yourself mm -hmm. for being abused or mistreated. Mm -hmm. It's important to remember that you're not the cause of the abuse. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that it's it's so easy to get caught up with. Mm -hmm. You deserve to be treated with respect. You deserve to be safe. You deserve to be happy. Yeah. And I think it's it, especially if there's elements of psychological abuse in there, it's really easy. Yeah. Um, when it comes as well really to, to that. emotional abuse and psychological abuse, one thing that helped me when I was in that was looking at my friends and family and going, would my friends and family ever talk to me in the way or treat me the way that this person's treating me? Yeah. I think that for me was the first trigger because I could go, yeah, but he really cares about mm. me. Yeah, but he treats me really nice sometimes. And, he did. and I was like, but the people that truly love me unconditionally, did, would they ever say these things or make me feel like that? Yeah. Um, which I think links into you are not the cause because you could be fooled into thinking, yeah. well, I, sometimes I'm not perfect, but you go, yeah. but even in my friendships, I'm yeah, not perfect. Abs absolutely, none of us like are perfect. This. It still doesn't warrant being abused in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also important to remember that you're not alone. Yeah, Like there's, you've, there's experiences from us two, people are getting in touch with a podcast, mm -hmm. like you're not alone. And I think yeah. that's really important because it can feel like a really mm -hmm. scary place. Yeah. So obviously if you are suspecting that you're going through abuse, whether it's emotional, physical, any of the ones we've touched on, you might be someone that goes, I'm not willing to leave because I love this person and um, they've said they're going to change. They've said they're going to change, but there are some signs of... And sometimes people just have maybe have been in a shit relationship before. That's how they've coped and behaved. Yeah. And you make them aware of it and it never happens again. Yeah. And, you know, may maybe, you know, giving someone the benefit of the doubt, maybe that happens. Yeah. But I think it's important to spot signs. Well, definitely. If you have chosen to give the person the benefit of the doubt, that is not for us to comment on whether that's the right thing to do. But yeah. if you have decided that, then you need to look for signs that the person has changed. And if they haven't, then you need to think more deeply about it. Yeah. And, and some signs that they haven't changed is that they minimize or deny that the abuse happened. Yeah. Because if you're changing, you you admit to it. You say, I did that, I fucked up. Yeah. They might continue to blame other people for their issues or their behaviors, whether it's they might blame you or they might blame other people. Oh, it's because of my childhood. It's because of this. Instead of taking ownership of their behavior and saying, yeah. actually, despite that thing happening to me in my childhood, I have the, what's the word? I have the control of my life, the autonomy that's the word yeah or over me and my behavior yeah they might they might claim that you are the abusive one or that you've caused it or um they might pressure you into going to couples counseling which is 
You might think maybe that's not such a bad thing, but actually if this is a one-sided behavior that is coming from your partner... It's like they're trying to drag you into the room yeah, with them. And go, actually, this is a joint couples thing. I don't really know if that's the right solution. Yeah, or they might be constantly telling you that you owe them another chance. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a, like a real telltale yeah. sign. I think another one is also being threatened with but I need you in order to make these changes. Mm. If that is the case, that this is that's another layer of, of like abuse making you stay. And... Yeah, because the, they them changing shouldn't rely on you being in a relationship with them. Yeah, and I think lastly, just making pressuring you to make decisions about the relationships. Yeah, like well, if you do, if you say this, yeah. then our relationship is over. And if mm. you do, like you know that kind of. Yeah extremes yeah. of you know rationalizations and 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 ultimatums and and things yeah. making pressure pressuring you to make decisions about relationships mm -hmm. as well yeah. um, and it's important to have these signs mm -hmm. so that you know well if they're not changing yeah then you can begin to make an informed decision about whether you whether you go or whether you stay um and it's time to make a plan as well. Even if you haven't, um, cool. if you decide to stay, just in case things change, have an escape plan yeah. like sorted. That's what I did. I wasn't, mine was more of a emotionally abusive relationship that I'd had with an ex-partner with, there was a couple of times it got a bit physical with chucking things at my head. It seemed to enjoy doing that, even though they might be small things that, you know, still hurt. Anyway, I ended it and left and went home to my parents and stayed there for about a week. And I'm glad I did because he kept coming to my house. He got his friends to call me and say, uh, blah, 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 outside your house. Like you've really upset him. Despite him being the abusive one, it was mm. then even his friends were making it my problem. But I was so glad that I left because by the time I came back to London to my flat, I mean, it was only a, uh, a week that I spent away. He'd given up physically he then was sending emails mm. and stuff but he wasn't there knocking on my dog so i knew that i wouldn't have the strength to keep the door locked if yeah. he was there i would have well, let him in brain on the door, exactly yeah. so have an escape plan yeah have, have an escape plan so you know what you're going to do where you're going to go and be ready to go mm -hmm. you know the cars the fuel's full especially if it starts to descend into you know where i mean you saw from brad's video the th where, where the threat can go mm. make sure like you've practiced it or rehearsed it and you know where you're gonna go mm -hmm. um i think that's that's really important and also having a list mm -hmm. of contacts um and people that you can you know if, if things do go south yeah. who are you going to tell because you you need people yeah. to know a that you're safe and or if you're not yeah um who are those people going to be how are you going to contact them is it going to be a phone call is it going to be a text i also think telling people is a really good technique for making sure you commit to a decision because i knew that as soon as i told my mum and dad there is no coming back there yeah. was no way they would ever accept him into our family and the same with my friends they were like as soon as they were as soon as i told uh, my housemate, she was like, I never want to see that man ever again. Mm. And if I do, blah, 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 blah. So telling people is actually a really good insurance policy yeah. that you don't, in a weak moment, go back to them because yeah. you know that you can't. You've burnt the bridges between them and everyone in your life. Like a level of accountability, like yeah. a safety net. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people decide to stay for whatever reason. Maybe they feel like they don't, maybe they don't have anywhere to go. You know, there's, it's it's really easy to just say get up and leave. Um, and, and it's not always easy as that. So I think if you do end up staying in an, in an abusive relationship, then you, you need to contact some kind of domestic violence charity or helpline, make, make them aware of it. And also they can support you in a way that um, will allow you to get through it. Build as strong a support network as you can, because obviously depending on what's going on in the relationship, if they're particularly controlling or something's mm -hmm. going on, then it's important to, to have a, a support network around you and also do things where you can that you enjoy mm -hmm. that give you that because it can feel it's going to at times feel very oppressive until you're maybe in a position where you are able to leave mm -hmm. um and you know looking after your own mental health and and your sanity is really important yeah um 
And lastly, if you suspect your friend or family member of being in an abusive relationship, um, we will actually link an article down below from a charity website of of a full thing of advice of what to yeah, do. Yeah, it's from a website called lgbthero.org. Yeah. Um, I think the main one is, firstly, keeping in touch with this person. Keep regular communication open with them, even if they haven't told you that they're going yeah. through an abusive relationship just stay in regular touch with them because then at least you can you sort of got your finger on the pulse yeah, you sort you, of know what's going on you know if there's changes yeah yeah because there's two there's two different things here there's whether you suspect it or whether they confide in you yeah so if you suspect it yeah keep keep in contact with them take notes mm -hmm. as well in case something happens you know on this day they came with a black eye or whatever you know yeah. things like that are going to be really important and mm -hmm. subtly gently point them towards support yeah. do you know do you think this might be helpful is there anything going yeah. on um but obviously don't confront them and try and put them on the spot and challenge those statement abusive statements if they've confided in you i know that when there was a voice that i've gotten so used to being like verbally abused by my partner he sent me a, a really abusive voice note in hindsight at the time i just was used to it and when i actually took time to show one of my friends and was like is this normal she was absolutely horrified at the way that he was speaking to me and she was challenging that mm. and i think that's really key if you are a friend to not just hear it and go okay well like actively challenge that because that's how they're gonna learn that that's not okay yeah, and then just a couple of things. If someone confides in you, just listen. Yeah. Just listen. It's about them. It's not about you. Yeah, don't pressure them into making a decision right here, right now, or provide them with ultimatums. If you don't do this by this date, then I'm going to get involved. Like, never pressure a person like that because situations might be a bit more dangerous than you realize. Yeah, and don't obviously don't imply it's their fault. Obviously, if you've listened to the podcast, yeah. you won't do that anyway, but don't imply it's their fault and don't pressure them for too much information. Yeah. You know, the fact that they've confided in you mm -hmm. is probably a really big step. So just slowly, slowly catch your monkey yeah. with um, moving things forward. Mm. So to wrap this up, I know we've it's been a heavy, heavy podcast. We're not going to do a no formal homo. Well, the, the no formal homo really is is asking for help yeah. or is for whether you are someone who's involved in an abusive relationship or you see someone who is or you're worried about someone that is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's reaching out and getting in touch with relevant people mm -hmm. um we have dropped uh there's all the the charities the helplines uh there's gallop which is gay and lesbian bisexual trans transgender people uh domestic abuse line there's male male which is uh predominantly for for men's domestic abuse there's the, the domestic abuse hotline mm -hmm. um there's there's quite a few charities in there and and emails and phone numbers so yeah. if you need them check them out Definitely. And the only, if we were to do No FOMO Homo, one book which I read at the time when I was going through that experience was, if he's so great, then why do I feel so bad? Type that into Google. I don't know off the top of my head what author it was from, but it was really, really great. Again, written, written from the perspective of, you're probably a woman being abused by a man, but I still found it very helpful. And it also highlighted that usually people like this do tend to target strong independent people the psychotherapist was like it's really strange most of the women that come into my office were strong independent women ceos and they go how on earth could i ever let myself be manipulated by mm. these people but they narcissistic people tend to which tend to be the trait of the abuser tend to target high powered people so you shouldn't be feeling oh i'm i'm a weak person i'm so mm. stupid i'm so dumb because normally it tends to be the other way around yeah absolutely so i hope this has been helpful mm -hmm. um hopefully we you know talking about a topic that isn't talked about a lot thank you to all the people who've got in touch brad jordan robert um thank you to you guys for watching for listening if you've enjoyed it please rate us please review the the podcast that bumps us up the chart more people see important topics like this and it helps more people and more people are having yeah. that discussion yeah. um yeah, thank you so much, guys. Uh, again, if you want to get in touch with us about anything, you can email us, hello at happyhealthyhomo.com, and we will see you next week. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.